far north as Kataya. I hear some people right about over here, right behind me, saying Kaya. <laughs> so, Kao, is that how you pronounce it? A little bit further north in Kataya, I think, isn't it? So, we might be good of you. Thank you for being here. I'd like to thank the uh, operators of this facility, too, for the wonderful job they've done assisting us in getting set up this morning. We appreciate that very, very much. City of Zion, be full of joy. People of Jerusalem, shout. See, your king comes to you. He has power to save. I think most of you will recognize that this was said by the prophet Zechariah about the city of Jerusalem. Some years ago, I was privileged to visit the city of Jerusalem, and I have to tell you, it wasn't exactly a place that was full of joy. The name Jerusalem means peace and safety. And as you will recognize throughout its history, at least in recent times, it's been anything but a place of peace and safety. In fact, even while a number of us were visiting there, there were portions of the city into which we could not go for safety reasons. And at night time, occasionally, even while we were there for just a few days, we would hear some shelling off in the distance. And yet, many years before Jesus Christ came to earth, the prophet Zechariah said that the city of Jerusalem would one day be full of joy. And the people of Jerusalem could shout because a king would come to them, and that king would have power to save. I think we still need some kind of king, don't you? A good king. A king who has power to save. Politicians and policemen don't have power to save. Scientists and philosophers don't have power to save. Counselors and doctors do good work, but they don't have power to save. It's not hard to find examples of the need to save, of the need for a good king who would restore joy we were to create things in such a way that we would shout for joy most of our days. That would be a good thing, wouldn't it? But we don't have that right now. Just the day before yesterday, I believe it was, there was a man in court in Auckland. You might remember the story back in January of last year. He went over to Great Barrier Island and he abducted his ex-girlfriend and beat her up held her for about 38 hours, and abused her, tortured her. And that's the kind of reminder that we have all too often in this land of ours. I went off to America for 33 years, and when I came back to New Zealand about three and a half years ago, there was still in my mind this kind of idyllic, pristine, pastoral land that I left 33 years before. And I tell you, this land has changed in that time. We live in a place that is desperately in need of joy and peace and security. And I believe that that is what the scriptures were prophesying way back, 500 years before Jesus Christ came in the time of the prophet Zechariah. And look at what Zechariah said about this king who would come. He's gentle. He's going to be riding on a donkey. He's sitting on a donkey's colt. Now this is kind of surprising. Rather startling actually. If you told me back then that a king was coming, I would have had in my mind a picture of someone in a chariot, someone on a stallion, someone at least in a stretch limousine, but on a donkey. 
Give me a break. A donkey is what poor people have when they can't afford a horse. A donkey is peasant transportation. It's not king transportation. Kings don't do donkeys. Ordinary people do donkeys. But this would be a different kind of king. It would be exactly the kind of king that we need. King on a donkey. It's almost like you get invited to some fancy event in the middle of downtown Auckland. And they say to you, oh, Ed, or whatever your name is, they say, don't worry, we'll send a limousine to pick you up. And when you look out your window, you see that a car has arrived, but it's a 10-year-old Suzuki Swift with a manual transmission and a 1300cc motor. And they put you in that and take you off to the special event. It's rather demoting. But that's part of the beautiful picture that we have about the king who would come. He would not come with trumpets and chariots and horses. He would sneak in quietly into human society. He would ride in on a donkey, so to speak. But the appearances would be a little bit deceptive because this would be a king who would come with the greatest power this earth has ever seen. This king would set the prisoners free from where their enemies are keeping them. <clears throat> Think about that. Some of you here think you might know me pretty well, but you may not know that I've been in prison. As a visitor. <laughs> as a chaplain. And every time I've left prison after visiting there, I've been praising God that I'm not bound in that prison. I'm not there for years or for the rest of my life. It's a wonderful feeling to hear the gates clang shut behind you and walk out into the sunshine a free man. And when you do that, you always feel sadness, sorrow for those who cannot do that. But this king would set the prisoners free. Now, my father was in prison. He was in prison for a couple of years during World War II. He was from Invercargill, way down south in this beautiful land. And he was captured. And he was kept in a prison there, in a German prison camp, for quite a long time. But this king will set the prisoners free. Now, in fact, I have been in a real prison. And I'm speaking here of a different kind of prison. I must not get so excited. A different kind of prison. There are people in this land who are prisoners in their own homes. There are people who, held, who are being held prisoners by drugs, by alcohol, by poverty, by abuse, by ignorance, by anxiety, by grief, by fear, loneliness, helplessness. There are people who are being held prisoners by pride, by arrogance, by status, by selfishness, by materialism. And I am here to tell you today that I have been a prisoner of some of those things. In a way, we are all prisoners. I couldn't help but think as I was preparing this message of what we know as Kim.com, remember his name? been all over the news in the last year or so. As you know, he was uh, arrested, taken off to prison in Auckland. He was living in fabulous conditions in a mansion or two in Auckland. Had many fine vehicles. But the FBI in America cooperated with the police in Auckland and took him off into custody, accusing him of online piracy. And certainly the smile was wiped off his face when he was arrested and put in prison. But I can't help but feel a touch of sadness for people like Kim.com. He's a German-Finnish businessman. He's just 38 years old. 
He has a wife. He has young children. And when the Christchurch earthquake hit, he gave quite a large sum of money to relieve the calamity, to relieve the suffering in the city of Christchurch. And you can see this comment I have up on there, there on the screen. And mm -hmm. I'd like you to repeat this with me, because sometimes we are a little too quick to judge. Will you say this with me, please, beginning, there is so much. Are you ready? There is so much good in the worst of us, and so much bad in the best of us, that it ill becomes any of us to speak evil of the rest of us. And I pray for people like Kim.com. Kim Schmitz is his real name. I pray for all of those who are bound in prison, whether literally or in a prison that they have created for themselves through the bad choices of their lives. And I am so glad again that the scriptures, even many hundreds of years ago, <coughs> proclaimed that one day a king would come and that king would set the prisoners free. The king is gentle. The king is riding on a donkey. The king is sitting on a donkey's colt. The king will set the prisoners free from where their enemies are keeping them. And the king will do this for a particular reason and from a particular method of being. The king will do this because of the blood that puts his covenant with us into effect. Please notice two words here. The blood and the covenant. The word covenant means agreement. Promise, commitment, undertaking. It is a very strong word, but it's used in the Bible. It's not as though God in heaven said, Oh yes, the people on earth, they're in a spot of trouble. If I can find the time, I must do something about that. If I can find a way, I might step in and help. It was nothing like that, my friends. God in heaven undertook a solemn commitment, an absolute covenant and agreement that he was going to solve the problem on planet earth. I'm very thankful for that, aren't you? And that covenant, that agreement, would be carried out through blood. It would be only through sacrifice that that could come about. Most kings, when they go into war, have a goal in mind. The goal is to shed the blood of the others for the advancement of themselves. But not this king. This king who would come from heaven to earth, his goal was different. The goal of this king was to shed his own blood so that he could advance the others. He would make a sacrifice of his own life so the lives out there that were held in prison and held by chains could be set free. He is, at that point, not the conquering king, but rather the suffering servant. When he came into this world, he said, I am going to die for China. I am going to die for India. I am going to die for the United States. I am going to die for New Zealand. I am going to die for Fongare and Dargabo and Kaitaya and Kaitoi and Kerry Kerry, Kaio and all the places around. This king was sacrificing himself so that you and I could be free and we could walk free into the sunshine. I want to give you an example of how this takes place. And I want to direct you, first of all, to the one who made it take place. Because 500 years after the prophecy of Zechariah, there was a prophet, a teacher, a rabbi, if you like, who appeared in Judea, in Galilee, and Samaria, in the Middle East. 
And one day, just several days, in fact, before his death, he asked someone to find him a donkey. So a donkey was found. And he came riding into Jerusalem, not in a stretch limo, not on a white stallion, not in a chariot, but he came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Who could have guessed that he was the king? He looked only like a peasant, but the people were happy to see him and they shouted. They were full of joy, just as Zechariah had prophesied. They shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And this, my friends, as the scripture says, was just as it is written in scripture. 500 years from the prophecy to the fulfillment. There are in the Bible more than 300 prophecies pointing directly to the coming of the king. Pointing to the fact that he would be descended from the line of David. Showing that he would die by crucifixion. Showing that he would be born in Bethlehem, going back a little further. Showing that when he died, his clothing would be divided up to the casting of lots. More than 300 specific predictions ahead of time about the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey and who would be the king who had come to set the people free. I would like to say especially to young people and children who are here this morning, do not let anybody tell you you are naive or stupid to believe in the one whose name is Jesus Christ. Do not let anyone convince you that it is ridiculous for you to believe in the scriptures, the word of God. When you think back in the history of some of the brightest minds in science, I'm thinking of people like Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler and Einstein. All of these men were believers in the sacred scriptures. Even Einstein, who was Jewish, was fascinated by the figure of Jesus Christ. He said, I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. My friends, there is good, rational reason to believe in the scriptures as the word of God. There is solid evidence from prophecy and from other sources, from the natural world, from the course of history, from human experience and testimony. There is solid evidence why reasonable minds like ours here this morning would choose to believe in the scriptures, the Old and the New Testaments, and to accept that the man who rode one day into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey is indeed the king who was prophesied who would come and set the prisoners free. I want to give you an illustration of how it all happens. One day this Jesus was walking along in his ministry around the area, and he came across a very sad case. In John chapter 5, we read where he came across a man who had been lying by a pool for 38 years. This man was crippled. This man couldn't move. This man had no joy in his life whatsoever. But as Jesus walked along, he said to him, Would you like to, to walk? Would you like to have your life back? The man dared to believe, dared to say, I'd love that, but it'll never happen. I have nobody to help me. And Jesus said to that man, rise, get up, pick up your mat and walk. <coughs> Nothing like this, friends, had ever been seen before. 
The man had been lying there for 38 years, simply stooped down, picked up his mat, and walked. You talk about joy in Jerusalem. You talk about shouting with joy once again. And he went on his way rejoicing. I find it interesting that he picked up his mat. This mat was what had borne him all of those years. That mat was no doubt stinking and threadbare. But he picked up the mat and he took it with him. The mat was his testimony. Look at this mat. I lay on this mat for 38 years, but someone today set me free. Someone today turned my despair into joy. It reminds me of someone who's perhaps been addicted to drugs for many years and is able.